Eric. Omar. First, your biceps are looking fantastic. That polo, I'm not sure what size it is, but come on now. Let's just say I don't have a sister, but I do buy clothes in case I one day do get a younger sister so that we can match. Hey, like do you the want same to just, size. You, you do that, right? When you buy matching clothes, you buy the same size, not just the same color. Eric, do you want to just make this episode about your physique update? Because you're looking fantastic. I mean, I, I, we have these guests, but like, honestly, you just mute, 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 mute. No big deal. I, there, I mean, we've done worse episodes. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> <laughs> imagine we start listing our least favorite ones, but also we start like listing and naming our least favorite guests. And it just becomes this candid tell from no reason whatsoever that actually lands us into our first bit of controversy like our real first controversy well like <laughs> as you said many times they're not our children we can have favorites mm-hmm. and let's be honest parents actually do have favorites yeah. like if you're the third sibling it ain't you you know yeah. and i say that as an only child because i have lived a life of privilege knowing that i'm always the favorite and the least favorite so oh, yeah dual identity Eric, let's uh, get into this a little bit not the actual episode which is going to be a monster episode it is a follow-up to the previous episode, but I'm noticing all the names. Do me a favor, Eric, read my name on the screen. And there's one minor discrepancy that I'm just noticing, and I do want to point it out. All right. So we do have three guests. But before we introduce our guests, because that would be, you know, far too hospitable for us, I'm going to mention that Jim Powers... Thank you. Is uh, is the name listed for for Omar Isaf. And and you can you can read these names if you were to join us on YouTube, the yeah. uh, the premier podcasting platform. So uh, thank you for that, Eric. It is fantastic. I'll say shout out to the YouTube community. They're not better than anyone else, the audio listeners, but uh, Patrick Close said, mentioned the number, what was it? 3165 if you made it to the end. And out of the 37 comments, there was over a dozen. So respect to everyone that makes it all the way to the end, even after we wrapped up and it's just extra banter at the end. You guys are the true listeners. But here, I want to point this out because I do want to ask uh, Patrick Close a pointed question. You have myself, Jim Powers. We have Eric Helms. We have Milo Wolf. All of these names sound exercise, science-y, fitness related. They ha- they have a name or names that conjure up images of authority, masculinity, confidence, competence. We have Max Coleman, okay? Maximum Coleman, first time joining us. Probably could change even if you wanted, make it uh, short form. Max Mann, just eliminate the coal, like any which way he wants, powerful name. So Milo Wolf, Max Coleman, Eric Helms, Jim Powers, and then we have Patroclos, Angelakis, Horakakis. Um, Pack, I just, it seems a little like Milo Wolf, Max Coleman. Do you think your ethnic name is a limiting factor in terms of you being taken seriously as an expert? I'm Jim Powers, you know. For sure. I, 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 the other day uh, we had a shout out by Brad, and I think he's. He's he's unaware that Andrew Lackis is one of the last names. <laughs> so uh, definitely. And that's why I've gone with Dr. Pack. As cringe as it is, and as Dr. Oz vibes as it is, hey, we salvaged it. God bless the PhDs. You I think you've actually got a few options. And and I, I you maybe you considered this one, but just Patroclos. Because that sounds like a Greek warrior to me, like who's just ready to sure. just to chuck a spear right through your heart it conjures up a lot of image images i think you could have like the the athlete page that is just patroclos and then just you looking off into the distance you know what do you think but you guys are cultured enough and have traveled or at least are cultured enough my apologies omar uh to be able to pronounce the name and be like oh it's a foreign name let me read it p uh, patroclos okay easy but for a lot of uh, fellow Brits as a British citizen and, you know, not fellow, but fellow Americans, I think I'd be getting a lot of Petroclaws, like even at the university here where they could literally copy paste the name from the registry, like I've seen at least 10 different variations of the name. And I'm like, well, I'd rather not take the risk. They, they're, they're misspelling Pac-Man. They're writing it with the C. It's like, cool. Let's give them three letters. We'll make the joke. Ha ha ha. Long Greek name. Everybody's happy. Why confuse people? Well, I tell you what. I stopped listening to you about 90 seconds in because I only pay attention to real lengths. And those are starting to get a little too long. I think we need to to pull that back on Instagram. So I totally agree. Great comment. Yeah. But um, yeah. Great comment, user <laughs> number five. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for your time and energy and for being on Iron Culture. 
Um, <laughs> but actually, that's a perfect segue to what we're talking about today, Omar. And it's yeah. trying to be someone involved in the communication of science, academia, cool. educating the listener, helping the fitness space, and coming up in maybe the modern era, rather than being a crusty old 41-year-old who's still benefiting from the hard work he put in on the bodybuilding.com forums, <laughs> and then the <laughs> the brazen new the social work. media platform of Facebook that I'm sure some of you have heard of, uh, which was a big challenge for me to transition from MySpace onto, but I did it because I am a pioneer. No, in all seriousness, we've got three pioneers on, we've got three young bloods, we, we've got three exercise scientists, sports scientists, whatever you want to call yourselves, who are also trying to bring the word to the masses, something that hasn't been very much needed uh, in, in our industry because historically hasn't really been the case. We've got Max Coleman, like you said, we've got Milo Wolf. Of course, neither one of those are real names and that's just how hard you have to play the game these days. And then Dr. Pack, technically also not a real name. Uh, and then Jim Powers, not a real name, but you still have the one true name person on this podcast, Eric Helms. And it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce Max Coleman, for the first time on the podcast, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. And then Milo, we've had you on. I, I had you on with Dr. Alyssa Joy Spence, or now Dr. Alyssa Joy Spence. I can't remember if she graduated at the time. And now we have you. I don't think you'd graduated at the time, Dr. Milo Wolf. We've got a, just a doctors emerging from the waters uh, of of all shores. How how are you doing, man? Welcome back. I'm doing fantastic. It's almost like everyone who comes into iron culture eventually has a PhD. So all I'm saying is Dr. Coleman coming soon, Dr. Powers as well. <laughs> so I'm just looking forward to that day. Uh, a lot of fitness information being spread soon. Well, I have to say this about you, Milo. Um, even if you didn't have your PhD, it feels like everyone around you lately has a PhD because they got some player hating degrees. And I'm just going to mm. get right to the heart of it. Wow. Yeah, is that I think... You are playing the game well. I think you are growing quickly. You're reaching a lot of people. And on the whole, your information is helpful. However, you have been the brunt of many criticisms and attacks from uh, people will say are your peers. He's the new blah, charitable. bro. He is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's rough. Put some, put some respect on my guy, guys, please. That's no, a whole yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Blah, huh? Um, no, the one, once he's on the podcast, which of course is not going to happen, <laughs> just to be real. I'm not even going to joke about it. I can't do it. Yeah, go, Eric. All right. So, you know, I, I honestly, but truly, I think a, this is a companion piece to when we had Dr. Pack on most recently. Um, and we want to talk about, because as, as I shared, I think quite candidly, um, and I really do mean it, and I've thought a lot about it, the strategies that worked for me to get me to the position I'm in, I'm now a beneficiary of. And I don't think that if I was just to be like, yeah, every time I'm on a random podcast with, you know, 600 people listening, I'll just put a square on Instagram, kill my own algorithm and watch it fall from, you know, a 1500 average engagement to 50. That's the strategy that's going to blow me up so that I can really communicate and educate the masses. And then, you know, occasionally I'll, I'll compete and get a boost because I have, you know, nudity. Like that's, that's the only successful thing I've done, which is just a byproduct, the fact that I'm obsessed with competing. So I don't think I know what to do, but I think y'all are doing some things right, but it is not an easy problem to solve. And I, I, I'm gonna frame it as a problem because it is hard to navigate and figure out um, what's the appropriate level of, as I like to say, uh, being the dancing monkey online um, while still keeping enough nuance for it truly actually be evidence-based. So this is, this is a roundtable discussion. None of us have the answers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that up right up front, but I think it's important because I do recognize that all three of you are trying, you care, and you're trying to do something useful. Yeah, I think it's really obvious to anyone who's actually met the three of you and who pays attention to the subtleties of how you deliver and what you deliver, that you're trying to make the space a better place. And I think that's something that sometimes gets lost in the... Uh, the brain swinging, I'll call it, uh, that, that goes on. Omar? No, yeah, we'll, we'll kick it right off. Eric, that was fantastic. And <clears throat> I'm optimistic, and that's it's not because we uh, refer to ourselves, Eric, kind of as custodians of the space where we've been around 
for a relatively long period of time, created a lot of content yourself. You are one of the true Eric OGs of science communication, where you pave the way, where you have the ability to talk about any topic, make it succinct enough, condense it down, not really miss any of the key important information and also make it enjoyable. The Helms Pyramid books, like shout out to you. So it's not because I do see us as custodians and I am not implying at all that you know, we're custodians of say like the Overlook Hotel. And yeah, we know there's still psychic vampires out there and totally we're leaving it to the next generation and they are doomed. Like their souls are absolutely going to be consumed. And we're not just trying to give the problem to someone else when I say I'm optimistic, but we are optimistic because I, I do think, and that's why maybe I want to kick it first to Milo with the subscriber count, then uh, pack and then the a new blood, Max, mainly because Max Coleman, I respect the hell out of you. I saw you in person. We had a great conversation, um, very positive, but there was a comment by someone. I'm not sure if it is someone that was using your name or was you saying something directly. And maybe that'll be our first bit of beef, but you left the comment on the last episode. Didn't appreciate it, man. And you said a uh, podcast about gatekeeping. Meanwhile, Omar, gatekeeping taste in movies. We'll talk about that in a second. But Milo, I want to hear first, and then we'll go to Patrick Close, how you view the landscape because, and this is maybe one of the questions, you are someone that, you know, you got your education, you also wore some of the watch videos, whether or not that played any role whatsoever in the formation of your content, who knows, but now you're actively engaging in the arena, the man in the arena. Uh, and you've been doing it now for, I think, what, almost like eight months, you'll tell me the uh, length of time, but you have accrued 20,000 subscribers, but you're, you're, gaining a following at such a rate that I would view what you're doing as being successful from, you know, like an analytical perspective of like, okay, what are you putting in? What are you getting out? I do want to give a quick note before I throw it over to you just to give your landscape, like your perspective, what you've learned, maybe, uh, you know, a wide variety of different things. I will say that what nobody understands, Eric, and that's another shout out, like you did this, like same idea with you. That's why like you're an OG, but like shout out also to Patrick Close and also Milo, just the amount of time, effort, and passion that needs to go in even to become, quote unquote, a success, meaning the thousands of dollars of Eric that you travel of your own volition to either do research, participate in conferences, things to put your name forward, learning about editing, learning about videography, learning about every single fact. There's thousands of dollars, there's hundreds of hours, and then also like the skill set that's underrated, I think, with this new generation, they grew up also watching content, which is actually a skill then subconsciously in the back of their mind where they kind of view it from both a viewer perspective and then a creator. So you have all of these things coalescing together and then people will just see the end result like, oh my, like the thumbnail, the, the title, whatever, like you're doing, uh, yeah, that's why you're successful. I'm like, oh yeah, it's not the thousands of hours across different disciplines that are then synthesized to this one thing. So I want to make sure we give respect. And again, I'm not optimistic because I'm bouncing, I'm retired and the custodians giving away the hotel to the psychic vampires. Tell me what your perspective has been since participating in a space. What have you learned? What has changed? What are your thoughts? Yeah. So first of all, I don't think the space is currently in a bad place. Um, obviously, I'm a young one. I, uh, I'm 24 years old. I haven't been around as long as some other people in the industry. But from what I've seen, like the average information out there now is better than it was five or 10 years ago. Like when I, when I first came up, one of the most prominent voices in fitness seemed to be Mike Chang. And that was my, my first inspiration. And like nowadays, if you look for people with a similar amount of influence, you're talking about Jeff Nippert, Jeremy Ethier. Like I can't think of too many big fitness YouTubers that have no, uh, no shade on Mike Chang, but a similar amount of misinformation. So I think in general, just by the, uh, the top players, things have gotten better. I also think in general, over the past five or 10 years, science-based content in fitness has grown. I think that nowadays you see big creators that are actually citing studies, that are actually presenting at least a few studies per video versus just using their own physique as their entire reference. Um, so I think things are generally moving in a good direction. I think any discussion of what is the appropriate strategy in navigating the current social media fitness landscape ultimately comes down to I think mostly, and this is an undervalued factor, your own personality and what you're comfortable with. Like we can all pretend all day long that this is about morality, right? We can all do that. And to an extent, it absolutely is. 
But we have to actually consciously think about it first versus just rationalizing away after the fact, which is what people usually do. Um, so I think most of it is just personality. Some people are comfortable with more uh, egregious clickbaiting and more, uh, more um, just risky, I guess, framings, um, whereas other people aren't. And that might honestly mo mostly be personality versus anything else. If we're going to go down the morality route, we have to weigh both the impact it has on the number of people it reaches and also the impact it ultimately has as far as, all right, let's say you got a lot of people in the door. Was the information you delivered thereafter actually good enough to make a positive impact? Because it's not just one or the other, it's ultimately both. It's just in the same way that people don't expect you to give a perfectly self-contextualized, self-contained statement within the first three words of a tweet. You wouldn't expect someone to give all the context necessary to fully understand a topic in the title of a YouTube video or the thumbnail or what have you. Ultimately, it is meant to draw the viewer in. It is meant to be a hook. If your thumbnail and title don't have a hook, there's a problem. And you could be arguing that from an ethical perspective, you're severely limiting your reach to the point that you're actually doing an ethical disservice because you're not reaching as many people as you could with the presumably or ostensibly good information that you have in your video. So ultimately, I think the title and thumbnail aren't actually that important. The real substance is ultimately in the actual content. Shocker, I know. Um, and so I think it just comes down to where do you draw the line? Personally, I see things more from a consequentialist perspective, where if the title and thumbnail allow me to get out to a wider audience and present good information, and also make people interested in topics. Much of what people talk about in the fitness, in the evidence-based fitness space is, let's provide good information for people. And I absolutely think that's a big part. But I think another big part is making people interested in seeing things from a scientific perspective to begin with and drawing people into the topic. If all you say is, you know, as a title, reviewing the science on supplementation that might be ergogenic or what have you, that is not going to get people in the door. That is not even going to make people interested because for many people, their brain isn't going to be able to process at a sufficiently fast pace what that title even means. So you need to frame things in a way that is both relevant to the viewer, they can easily understand like within a second of reading the title and thumbnail, and that gets them in the door. If you frame it in a too nuanced way, you often lose out on mass appeal, which can be arguably a good thing when you're talking about influencing a sufficiently large number of people to make a positive impact. And also just sometimes in 100 characters, you're not going to be able to provide all the context you need. And so I think ultimately, I see things from a more consequentialist perspective where if the substance is good, people come away from the videos thinking, knowing more about different topics than they came in with. I generally, through titles, thumbnails, my content, broadly speaking, and the way it's framed, I'm able to make people interested in science as a whole, what science has to say about a specific topic, and also the topic in and of itself. That is all a good thing. And ultimately, we can sit here and argue all day about this title and that thumbnail and that title and this thumbnail and whether you and I agree on the optimal volume or the optimal arm path during a pull-down or what have you. But ultimately, if the information being provided is above the current average, it is a rising tide. And that is ultimately what matters. And I think at this point, a lot of this concern over titling, thumbnail, framing, etc., is essentially a facade for just personal grudges or differences in personality expressing themselves. Um, so that's kind of my broad takeaway is I think that most of our attention and time would be better spent on making more content that is actually rising the tide, creating a rising tide um, versus worrying too much about the exact framing of things, provided the actual content is of a decent substance. And while everyone on this call ultimately is always striving to put out the best content possible, right? Like, I'm sure all of us have had videos where we're like, ah, this could have used some work or this wasn't perfect and what have you, and kind of had some regret with regards to that. The content we're putting out is still going to be, hopefully, above what is currently out there and is still going to create an improvement in the average fitness IQ. And I think that the moment we start debating nuances and specific titles and thumbnails and all that is the moment we really lose a lot of time and effort that we could instead be spending on actually bettering the community. 
because ultimately the titling and thumbnail, I don't think there is, I don't think much misinformation is being spread on the basis of a wrongfully titled YouTube video. You know? Like, I don't think people are like, yep, I saw this title on a YouTube video. I'm going to base my entire consensus on the topic based on just the title now. If, don't get me wrong, that sort of stuff happens to an extent with, for example, people reading abstracts of a paper versus the full paper. But specifically, I don't think that titles and thumbnails are really at the core of what informs people's understandings of different fitness topics. And so it really just serves as a hook. And your purpose as someone who is making content in the evidence-based fitness space is to make that hook engaging, get people in, and ultimately have them leaving your content more educated than they came in. And that's kind of my stance on how I create my content. Eric, there are, there are a few things here. There are a very important thing to follow up on and also give context for the audience where maybe they just consume a lot of this content. Um, and then I want to shift it over to Patrick Close to hear about his direction because he also has a YouTube channel where he's doing the damn thing and he's imparting his own style and flavor. But Milo brings up this concept of the hook. And in an environment where there's many different participants all vying for your eyeballs, how is one to stand out? And how is one in particular to stand out when you're just starting out? Because you don't have, there is such a thing that over time you accrue your audience, right? You have your followers, they enjoy your content. Then they are the ones that are spreading the good gospel. And it kind of becomes its own momentum that occurs. But until that point in time, how does someone stand out when they're trying to make videos? And the amount of views you actually get in a video is almost then a self-fulfilling prophecy where if you see like all of us right now, just think about also for the viewers, if you saw two competing videos, perfectly titled, thumbnail, but one has a million views and one has 17 views, which one are you more likely to click on? So I actually, I think that once you have a following, you start getting disproportionately rewarded, whereas to get off the ground running is far stickier. And so to me, it's more understandable with like, let's say Milo or like uh, a patch of clothes, anyone doesn't matter, uh, you know, utilizing some th uh, thumbnails or title techniques to reach a broader audience. Because here's the other kicker, Eric, and I want to hear your opinion on this, man, before we go to patch clothes. I think people are semi interested in, let's say, science based exercise information, but I say semi interested because you really have to coax it out of them. You have to invite them. You have to presented in a framework that is both digestible, that's perhaps entertaining. It's not their immediate thought. And you brought up uh, the idea like, and other people, I think I saw Jeff Nippard had a post about this, about a rising, like kind of either anti-intellectualism in the space or so there's so many different competing forces. The point is that for one to stand out, they need to be doing something. And the other thing I want to note, maybe for viewers, just to keep it in mind. And that's why I, I personally, like what well, you guys are, it's fantastic. It's not good. I think it's fantastic. And I think people don't even understand. That's the part that amuses me when I see like I, I see like a Patrick Gold's video. I'm like, this is a very well-made video. The amount of time and effort and skill it takes to make a video at that level is very high. And they're like, well, I like, have you considered this? Have you considered that? But the point I was going to make is that when you have the hook, when you have these thumbnails, when you have the title, that's one component. But the other part that's kind of missing, Eric, is that in many other industries, let's say like, I don't know, I'm making this up. Who knows? The, the film industry, you have directors, you have this and that. There's kind of like a, a gradual process of learning how to do it, or there's a network that then gives people opportunities. And to some, in some way, I think in the evidence-based space, the, uh, space, there's a bit of that, like, oh, I have a big YouTube channel, I'll feature you, and so on and so forth. But all this to say that if you're just starting out, like both of these dudes have PhDs, but for them to really gain momentum on their channel, they kind of have to do it on their own. And that's not a condemnation of our space, but that infrastructure has not been established. And that's something that I am kind of disappointed about that I do feel not a decade ago, but you brought up, I think either it was on the call or before the call, or, or one of you about like Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, right? Like I interviewed him in 2014. I interviewed him because I wanted to get the information right. I think we're talking about sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. It wasn't like Eric, people were like knocking on his door like, Brad, we got to do an interview. Like this, this article, this book you just wrote, we need to bring it to YouTube. There's a public good behind that. And I think, you know, it ebbs and flows uh, with time, but it seems like in 2024 that people, you know, people want to frame themselves understandably so as an expert or people that are, let's say, science communication adjacent where they want to make informative information, but I am the expert. But there's not kind of that network that I would like to see that I've seen in other spaces, not the fitness space, that allows people then that are putting out good information uh, to then reach a broader audience. No, I would agree with that. I, I think we're lacking uh, more intentional platforming. 
um, of, of, of people like this, because the, um, I think about the ways that I was able to come up, uh, and be visible. It was always through someone who was better at social media than I, you are obviously the most clear example of that. Uh, Omar, like the times I've been on your channel, uh, the course we made together for Kaizen, um, just you saying, Hey, we got to do something together. And you, I mean, in many ways, very altruistically, I mean, like it, of course it, it benefits you. It, it gives you access to information and a skill set. Um, but it, it, it probably disproportionately benefited me in many ways because you didn't, you didn't need me to keep you, what you were doing going, but in many ways, I did, I, but yes, go on. Spiritually, you might have, you know, you may, you may not be the Omar we all know and love without me. And I, I, I will, I will take that. I, I'll let that pass the, the humility sensor. But like Matt Ogus did not need to put me on, you know, you did not need to put me on. There are many people who have put me on over the years that's kept me enough in the public eye that I eventually was able to get my own foothold. Um, and I think for, I, I, I deeply appreciate and respect that because I know that those content creators they're, they're, they're not choosing me because I'm like the, the perfect combination of all the things that's going to get them the most views. There's easier ways to do it, but they're going, you know what, this guy has enough of the ability to communicate in a way that is broad enough to uh, appeal. Um, you know, he's got a few things going for him in terms of like, you know, title and clout and, you know, like I have a physique and I, we know that unfortunately matters far more than it should in our industry. And it used to matter even more. So I can, I can platform this person, but I think be, I think there's a, a component of it, and maybe this is arrogant for me to say it, that by platforming him is making the space better. So um, I see that as intentional and beneficial. And I think there's, because the space is a little more crowded, some people are seeing it as a zero sum game when it absolutely does not need to be, or it's just simply their ego. You know, I know there are some big content creators who don't want to be seen as content creators. They want to be seen as, you know, an intellectual who also does content creation. And they, they almost feel like they have to compete with the person they're bringing on. And I can understand that. Like, I'm a competitive person. And if I don't check myself, sometimes I can fall into that trap as well. And it's human. I get it. Especially in this. I mean, how many people think they need to include alpha in their title to be in our space? Like, obviously, it's... it's um, it's not a great space, to be honest. Like the more I talk no, about it, like, why are you guys it. even? Don't think about it too much, bro. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Fitness is wonderful. Health is wonderful, and mm. the pursuit of iron can be great. <laughs> and there are many people in our space who I will not think of as I speak, so I stay on topic and don't blackpill myself. Nonetheless, I think we do need to be more intentional with trying to pay it forward and bring people up. Um, and uh, that's not just us patting ourselves on the back for this podcast episode, but I think. It's, I, I wouldn't be here without that or the equivalent of it from, from a decade ago. So I totally agree with you. Eric. Fantastic, man. And I, and I do think that's what I like. Like I see even, let's say, Max is just entering the fray, but I see even uh, between Patrick Lowe's and Milo, like how you guys obviously like you do business together and so on and so forth. But there is power in networks, but genuine, like not just like transactional business arrangements. Like I'll show you, you show me out like that. That was also like, let's flip it uh, on the other side, Eric. Some of the lamest shit on YouTube back in the day with fitness was that people would do collaborations with obviously the intention. I remember, I won't name this person, but they told someone else after I did a video with them. And it was like kind of the idea of like intentional platform and to your point that they were disappointed that they only gained this is years ago, a decade ago, like like 500 followers. You know what I mean? And like that was that was the thing is like it was a numerical amount that they desired. Um, and that and, and that's a totally different scope. And the idea of bettering the space by bringing someone that has, you know, a certain skill set, I think it's underutilized. So let's go now to Patrick Close, the other person who has, oh, a YouTube channel, which is the only metric that we use to evaluate whether or not someone's putting on information. Yeah. Instagram reels, story, the pandemic, I never caught up. TikTok, very valuable, actually. And like you can distill information down in a very short time frame. I think I want to see more people, honestly, in the evidence-based space utilize emerging media and the way they need to be to keep it engaging while not losing any of the fidelity of the information, it's, it's possible. But anyways, YouTube, the gold standard, Patrick Close, entering now the fray himself, making content that to me is very interesting where it seems to me, and I want to hear your perspective on this, uh, Patrick Close, what you're doing that I find you, I think you're a very humorous person. I mean, like a genuinely funny person, like the, the whole like intro bit that you have. I view you as a bit of an artist, an idea that you have a vision, something like you want to do skits. Uh, so you're injecting a lot of personality, but also it seems like 
you're shaping your content in a way that maybe first you're the you're the principal viewer at first like would i find this engaging or is this explained in a way that i would like it and then also bringing high levels of information which i find intriguing because i think not one trap but the first barrier as we kind of said in the previous episode you need to have the information right you need to have the information right you need to communicate it well well then if you do have it's not a zero sum game but if you have thousands of people making like you know perfectly correct information that's perfectly distilled down in a five or eight minute blocks like the three best tricep exercises at some point, you know, there, there's going to be a, a, it's going to dilute the overall space where people are like, I've seen that before. And so I do think like personality or the content part where you're making content for an intended audience with the platform in mind becomes important. So that's something that I respect about the content you put out. What is your overall kind of viewpoint since doing it? You kind of explained to me more uh, uh, privately, like you want to do it. You also want to enjoy it. You don't want this thing to feel laborious. Like, okay, guys, I'm making my three videos a week. Like this video ranked number one. Now I'm just going to make follow-up videos with the exact same topics, so on and so forth. Like, what is your approach? How do you find the space? What are maybe some things that surprise you? Talk to us, man. So the the first thing to to touch on, I'm celebrating as well, Max. Every day is a celebration. The camera is doing you dirty. For those that are listening, the built-in effects of uh, Apple computers uh, are going nuts over at Max Coleman's uh, screen. But um, from my perspective, the thinking was this. I am somebody who loves lifting and wants to get more people to lift, wants to get more people to engage in resistance training, and wants to help those that don't necessarily care about interacting with the science as deeply as we do, but still want to make amazing gains, get jacked, and so on and so forth. And in this sea of information, want to have a quote-unquote safe space where they can go and some guy can tell them, look, the basics, the basics, the basics, and here's the science to tell you that, hey, it, it doesn't matter that much. Here's things that you can do to optimize if you wish to, but at the end of the day, you do not necessarily need to lose your mind over exercise selection or the latest optimization technique. Um, at the same time, on a personal level, and as we talked about last time, uh, social media like Instagram, maybe TikTok, threads, shreds, um, could not, you know, could potentially not be there in a, in a few years. And I want to make a living off of lifting and I want to make a living off of being an educator in lifting. As somebody who has taught at universities before and seen that, okay, my reach here is very limited. Obviously, I'm still engaging in that side of things and I'm about to take uh, on a, a PhD student from Greece uh, simply because I'm really interested in his project. He's a, he's an amazing guy, very driven, blah, blah, blah. That takes other boxes in my head as an educator. But as an educator, I want to be out there. I want to be able to get my message to more people. And I want to potentially leverage that in order to be financially okay. I, like, well, let's, let's not lie here. This is not, you know, us selling out to make millions. Sure. And for those that don't know our main sources of income, I'll just speak for myself, actually, for the past three years have been full-time coaching. So working one-on-one -on -one with an average of like 60 people per, per year uh, and writing research review related items. So in my head, I was like, okay, YouTube, we got to do this. And sure, look, I don't want to do the same content as Jeff Nippar does or as, as Milo does, because that's not me. I'd rather link to Milo's super analytical and really well-produced high-level videos that that target a somewhat different audience than mine. And I want to play the game to a certain extent, but at the same time, take a step back and not do stuff that I hate, but while recognizing that, hey, look, we'll have to invest money. We will have to pay attention to details. And if we're, da like in Greek, we have a say that like, you're in the dance now, might as well dance. You might as well do it properly. I get people not wanting to play the game, and that's fine. But if calling other people out because they chose to pay attention to the thumbnail and to the title, like I released a video yesterday and the title and the thumbnail were meh, and that instantly impacted the video and how it did. And that was one of my best videos, I think. No mumbo jumbo jargon inside, no bad information, not really selling anything. So I take somewhat of an offense when people criticize people playing the game because to play the game, and I've seen that from the music industry where 
as somebody who has made music in the past and has pe- friends who are high level musicians and make a proper living and have big time deals, blah, 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 to make commercial music. And that was a thing back in hip hop. Oh, he's a sellout. Yeah. You know, that's commercial. And it's like, it's not easy. It's very difficult to reach a lot of people. It's not, oh yeah, yeah. Put out a a video with a thumbnail and a title and all of a sudden people are, you're getting subscribers and views and you have to be extremely consistent. You have to spend a solid amount of money unless you are that one guy that makes it with streams or like an unorthodox sort of uh, uh, format. And at the end of the day, sitting back or sitting on the Academia Ivory Tower and essentially grouping a bunch of people that make educational content for lifters and putting them in this sort of unethical basket or this sellout or social media PhD or whatever basket, I find that offensive because hey, bro, it's not, one, it's not as simple, and two, don't play the the card that, uh, yeah, I just choose to do it, but I am doing better things than you guys because I'm doing research because we're doing that as well, you know? And I'm making it a bit more personal here, but I'll take a step back. So, yeah, YouTube is a, is a great way to, to get out there and, you know, if I want to be here as an educator in, in 10 years and, and have more options than just being in academia, that's a game I need to play and I will play it. Eric, I want to hear, man, your thoughts. And then we're going to go to the the new blood, Maximum Coleman. Afterwards, to hear your thoughts as someone that's been an observer. And now you're about to dip that toe. We saw everyone saw everyone. And we're going to have everyone's link in the description. Shout out Kai. You could go ahead and follow Max's first like real reel, uh, which had, you know, a grilled cheese to entice people at the start of it. And I thought that was just a very interesting choice we'll get into in a little bit. But uh, Patrick Close, so as someone who's now been in the space for a while, as you said, you've been coaching full-time for the last several years and you also uh, uh, write a research review. Um, And now you're stepping into content creation. You see kind of that loop of people, you know, judging either a thumbnail or a title. And that's just, as Milo said, that is just the smallest, most superficial layer of everything you're doing, like a title and a thumbnail, I don't know, like let's say it's 20 minutes of work or, or whatnot, but it can have, there's no other, and I will call it an art form. And that's that's one of the things I want to stress. Not that we're all beholden to this level, to the algorithm, Eric. I want to, like I said, hear your opinion, man. But I think people don't recognize how intentional is the word I was thinking that you have to be with all of this during the heyday of the uh, my YouTube where, like I said, per month, I said that uh, last week is like two to three million views per month on lock for like a decade. Um, and that's like over time, you have the consistency to your point, uh, Patrick Close, where you could coast now, shout out to uh, uh, Rascal and everything for the last four years, not really making any content and like still to do the damn thing and like chill. It's because of, you know, finding an audience, the luck, the circumstance, the randomness, like the, the year spent, but there wasn't a single month during that entire 10 year run then that I wasn't very intentional in terms of, okay, here's the topic I'm going to cover. Here's how I'm going to cover it. The amount of effort that gets put into the final product, most people aren't aware of. And that's what's interesting to me, what you just said, uh, Patrick Lowe's. I think people on the outside, and it's only the experiential knowledge, they'll give it to you because you get kind of that uh, dynamic feedback in the system. Oh, this worked, this didn't work, what, what I need to do. There's no other art form. Like, think about it. If the movie poster, even the trailer, like a trailer can entice someone to watch a movie, but it's kind of word of mouth. Oftentimes you hear so many instances like Top Gun uh, Maverick, whatever that film, it grossed uh, a lot of uh, money. The trailer, yeah, it did well. It's fine, right? But it was primarily word of mouth that made it turn into a billion dollar property. There's no other art form where your title and thumbnail to what Patrick Close just said, if he does it wrong, that video could be screwed. It could be the best, most well-produced video. You, you're like, man, I've really distilled all this information down. And that's why the stakes are quite high. And another thing that you said, and then I want to kick over you, Eric, and then we'll kick it over to Max, is that every single person that participates in this space, and I mentioned this last year, unless you're being rewarded at the very, very top, and there's only less than a handful of people, where not that you can rest on your laurels, but you don't have to think about this within the time frame of a month or several months. Everyone, it's a constant kind of battle of how am I going to title this? What type of content am I going to make? What's going to be the response? What do I want the response to be? Am I attempting to grow more? Am I staying the same? Am I actually losing followers or shrinking over time or the views are going down? It is constantly on your mind. Not that it is overbearing at any way, shape, or form, 
But if we think about, you know, let's say you brought up uh, hip hop, uh, Patrick Glows, an artist is like, if your next album bombs or flops, like you're kind of done. You know what I mean? Like you have a certain leeway that's allowed, but you do need to be actively engaged in the space. And someone brought up, I forget who, I think it was uh, Milo, brought up Mike Chang. Speed, uh, speaking of which, now the second chances aren't popular. Did you guys know that Mike Chang is now on TikTok? And he's actually doing well on TikTok as an example a decade later. So he got roasted to oblivion. People don't even know that Mike Chang, I believe, did not own Six Pack Shortcuts. He was the voice of it and the face of it. And now he's kind of on his own journey. So I'm not saying like, oh my God, Patrick Close, five videos in a row, shit titles, you're done, kid, your channel, it's been eliminated. But just always that it is at the back of your mind and primarily being a social media content creator, and we are trying to communicate to a general audience, you need to think about these things. Eric, I want to hear your thoughts, man. And then I want to go over to Max. No, I, I like I like what Pac brought up. As someone who is really big into hip hop as well in the same era, I, I, it makes a lot of sense to me because there are people, for example, who would have something negative to say about Eminem or Jay-Z, no matter what, even though they are objectively incredibly skilled lyricists, but simply because they were popular at that level. And you could kind of get like it was it became very obvious because you, you do. I try to pin them down I'm like, all right, so you're not impressed with eight bars of every single bar having a four syllable rhyme scheme and also having a punchline every like third sentence and with a good beat. Be, like, so so who, who is better? And they give me, you know, some throwaway example. And I'm like, yeah, that's just someone who's, you know, comparable in terms of skill who doesn't know how to make a good hook or who doesn't have a good producer. Like that's the only difference, you know? And so now you're getting people exposed for the first time to actual skilled lyricism. That's a bad thing. And it, it, it like, there's a difference between like gatekeeping and hipsterism and actual appreciation of good art and actually acknowledging, cause if you've tried it that, oh, he's actually a really skilled lyricist. That's a very good beat. And they've managed to, to do that while still cracking the code to be commercially successful. And like th those type of people who I was talking about who are gatekeepy, they always point to the outliers, the people who are successful, that's on sheer, sheer force of personality, which was the way we did things 10, 12 years ago. Like, like those people who will criticize Jay-Z and, uh, and Eminem back, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, they'd be like, well, like, who do you like who's commercially successful? And they try to defend that they're not just being gatekeepers. Like, oh, you know, Andre 3000. And I'm like, all right, Andre 3000 is like, Jimi Hendrix, dude, like there's, there's, there's one of him. He is incredibly unique. And that's, that's his thing that gets him out of the crowd, you know, and he's a good lyricist. And also guess what? He's got big boy, like, you know, like outcast, like, so like, I'm not sure he would have been able to blow up if he didn't have that kind of, you know, like counterbalance. So it's, I, that, that'll make no sense to a bunch of people who listen, but Pac knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the other thing I think 100%. was really interesting that Pac brought up was, um, the social media PhD thing. And that I think is something that's an extension of the Sagan effect that I talked about in the last episode, the well-documented, um, view that comes from other people who kind of see themselves as, as part of academia. That is not just jealousy. It, it's this skepticism towards people who are doing science publicly because maybe they're not doing it for the right reasons. And I, I, I empathize with that a lot more these days with the Hubermans that are out there and and the fact that that actually is now a problem, but that existed in, in, in the eighties and nineties and two thousands and, and all the way through the teens and still does today. And a lot of the times it is counterproductive. It is gatekeepy and it is a inaccurate assessment uh, of what's going on. So I, I understand the frustration. I'm glad you got a little personal because I think people need to see that. I think people need to see that, um, people are trying very hard to do things and it's not some, you know, big you know, like kind of production behind you guys. We're all figuring this out on our own. And I also find it very hypocritical for someone who is actually in the science or can read the science as a good science communicator and well-read to take shots at someone for not being nuanced enough or getting it right or, or not doing it the way they would do it um, on platforms where you're limited to a 90-second reel or you're limited to a couple carousels of posts and to point out that that wasn't nuanced enough, but not actually leverage the principle of charity, which is part of actual scientific thinking and engagement, because you're trying to understand the person in the best light possible and elevate the conversation rather than just taking cheap shots at somebody on a reaction video. 
hypocritical of all hypocritical, but ignoring the fact that maybe in their long form podcast episode or their long ish form YouTube video or in the actual paper that they're trying to get people to go think about that they were incredibly nuanced. You know, so if you're calling yourself an evidence based content creator and you're not leveraging the principle of charity, that's a mark against you because the principle of charity is how we, we're not trying to win. We're not trying to be right. We're trying to be correct. Right. So if we don't engage each other with the principle of charity to help us, you know, first seek to understand and then elevate the conversation and go, hey, I noticed in your paper, this is how I would do it. Like, let's say I, had, I actually had a problem with Milo, the way he was talking about LinkedIn partials. I said, hey, you know, in your paper, you said that these might only produce a small beneficial effect size. We need more data, et cetera, et cetera. But in your video, you said this is the best leg exercise and this one's the worst. But if the effect size is only a small difference, do, do you think that's an appropriate framing? You know, at least then I put it forth. Like I, I would show that he's he's done this work. He said those things, and and that I can maybe show an incongruence. And he might say something like, "No, that's that's a good point." Um, you know, how would you do it differently, et cetera? Or he'd say, "Yeah, I I did the best I could, but I wanted people just to simply click on it because if I call a common exercise the worst, they're going to be like, "Oh, why? What? I don't agree with that." And they'll actually watch it and learn something. And then now we've had a conversation. Now something's gone on. But if you're just taking the easy win, if you're uncharitably saying, oh, he said like the, uh, the traps weren't being involved in a rack pull, this guy has a PhD in biomechanics, but actually he thinks that the arms aren't even attached to the body. Huh? Like the person, if you're, if you're listening to this, you, you know that I know that you didn't take a charitable view there. You took an easy win, you know, and, and people do that a lot. And if you're going to be critiquing someone playing the game, that's the game that you just did right there. That's a reaction video, bro. Like that's not a legitimate critique. Even worse that's content, you taking, arguably. Yeah, it's, is you taking the easy dunk and then maybe you make yourself feel better about it and rationalize it by going, oh, then I'm going to educate him about the way that traps actually work. Like at least you did that. But I, like, I get it. I understand why it happens, but I think we just need to leverage or we need to put forth the same critique towards others that we think about on our own. And it's just that we need to be thinking about it and talking about it. Not doing the crabs in a barrel thing, you know? So I, uh, we all have egos. Egos are unavoidable, but you can leverage your ego to motivate yourself to do better, right? If your ego is attached to how much of a positive impact am I having on the space? How well am I, am I educating others? Am I the best educator? You know, it's so, some egotistical things you can manipulate your own, you know, nonsense into being less harmful and potentially helpful. Um, you know, if you attach yourself to being uh, like, I'm going to try to be the, 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 the brightest light in the industry. I'm going to try to educate people the most effectively. And I'm going to try to leave the space better than I found it. Yeah, you're, you find yourself to be a little competitive, you know, alpha wannabe in all cases. Attach it to that, you know, like know thyself and then, and then move it forward. But don't be the person who is just looking for opportunities to, to leverage yourself up by pulling down others because we don't need to do that is kind of something that, is, that has been bothering me. There's, there's no need to try to climb over someone else to, to, to get up. I really do think that it is not a zero-sum game and that there is space for everyone and that we can actually work together in ways that are more effective. And having constructive conversations rather than public call-outs um, to make this type of content a little bit better like, I, I would feel very comfortable talking to anyone on this call privately and being like, hey, you know, the way you said that and did that, I think you, you, maybe you didn't do more harm than good, but you could have done better. And here's how I think you could have done it. And maybe I'll learn something. And I, I, I need to be open to being wrong. And so long as the other person is, is open to critique, then we can all get somewhere. So, you know what? If, if, if you can get to the point where you can write a scientific paper or you can critique a scientific paper... You can get to the point where you have like that level shred of emotional intelligence. I I, I don't think like these 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 cognitive domains are, are are like that much harder just to be slightly mature. Am I am I crazy, Omar? Eric, but call outs are so fun. You just mentioned hip hop and Kendrick Lamar highlighted the falsehood of the big three of he called out J. Cole and he called out Drake. We need a little bit of this beef in order to make it interesting. Patrick Close. You put your finger up. No, but I, I, in all seriousness, I 100%. Uh, everything that you said. Unfortunately, we were too congruent, the five of us. I want to actively engage with some of the... Bring them in the arena, Eric. Let's, you know what? Let's, let's call them in the chat right now. Um, you raised your finger. I want to make sure I get to you, man, before we go to Max Coleman. 
I just wanted to briefly also highlight uh, the irony of um, people that are actively engaging in research and our academics and in the past have, you know, we've all cried about, hey, don't don't just uh, report on the, the, like, no, 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 just uh, don't just look at the abstract, don't just look at the title of the study, read the full text, read the full text, the full text, the full text, the full text. Um, this, it's the same people that will hate on the clickbaity thumbnail or the well-packaged video or the well-packaged whatever. It's like, bro, the same way we are not expecting to learn everything we need to learn about the study and the body of literature simply by looking at an abstract that says X led to more than Z. The same way, watch the whole video. Do you disagree with something on the 20-minute video that Milo or myself put out? And in Milo's videos, you know, sometimes there's like 15 to 20 citations. Do you disagree with something? Take it with Milo. Do a proper response video where you react and you present the literature and that's it. But simply putting every, everybody in the same basket uh, that, that's titled content creation that uh, essentially takes people that review whatever, chips and do eating challenges and simply because they're on YouTube and they're a content creator. Now we are in the same basket simply because we're on the same platform. I think that's a bit lame. Over to you, Max. Max, we want to hear your opinion, man, because you are the so-called newcomer, okay? We had the pleasure of meeting in person at the Arnold. And now I've, I've done some thinking, Eric, in the last, what, 51 minutes. Max, I want to apologize. It was a private conversation. But when you said that you view Transformers, uh, what was the Age of Darkness or whatever it's called, as a cinematic masterpiece, and I said that was a stupid fucking opinion, and you said it makes, you know, Vim Vendors, you know, Wings of Desire look like a shit film, and I said you don't know your time. I want to take those things back because I want to understand every single person, and maybe I did go on your letterbox, okay? And maybe I was that hater under every single recommendation after that conversation. But the more I look at you, the more enchanted I become because I see that long hair, I see that knowing look, I hear that deep voice, and now I'm hooked, okay? In terms of content, I wanna know what you're throwing down. You are just starting out, man, in this space. In terms of, I would say, producing content for the masses. I saw previously when uh, Pac and Milo were in New York, you guys like made a reel together and like I thought that was funny. But you see this landscape, you see 2024, you've been observing it for let's say years as the content overall. What's your perspective as a newcomer now to the space? You're seeing your friends now actively try and participate. You're seeing some of the responses by other people in the space of what they're doing, both positive and negative. But what's your overall viewpoint, man? And what do you maybe hope to accomplish in this space, like in a best case scenario, world domination? Yeah, I mean, just I just want to make money. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I'm just here doing Facts. what we all want to do Facts. and just please the shareholders. I think that's the <laughs> ultimate goal here. The landlords, landlords and uncles. Am I right, guys? I, uh, I, I think I want the exact same thing that everyone else on this call wants, which is that we want to teach people. It just is come, ultimately comes down to education. I mean, Pac, obviously, or Patrick Close, or whatever the fuck he wants to call himself, uh, ult comes from a family of educators the same way that I do. And ultimately, I think that all five of us just have that little tweak, that little gene that says, like, get the information out there. And uh, with respect to the call outs and, and us commenting on each other's content and, and saying that someone's thumbnail was too clickbaity or something like that, I... I I'm, I'm troubled with that in that on one hand, I think it's really annoying when people call out my friend Milo for not being nuanced enough in his 60 second video. And on the other hand, I think it's really good that people are calling out Milo because that's people always talk about like, oh, science is so annoying. It's always changing its mind. It's like that's what makes science as incredible as it is. Right. The constant changing of it and updating and improving over time. So while it's annoying, especially now that I am friends with these individuals, hearing people say like, oh, this dude's an idiot because he said X about leg extensions, right? At the same time, I'm like, it's good that we have this like self-correcting nature within the scientific community. And it would be nice if we could all point ourselves in the direction of like, look, pat each other on the back. We're all still doing and all generally still in like pointed towards being correct uh, so that we could be like kind of this allied force against the Mike Changs of the world, for instance. Uh, but I think that in of itself kind of inherently goes against the scientific nature that all of us bring to this area, right? Uh, I think that kind of moving away from that and just into my content itself, I think that I probably have the most Gen Z type of content here in that what's happening on screen has almost nothing to do with what I'm actually talking about. And we'll see how that actually plays out, given that I'm basically a no one. Uh, 
with respect to the other people on the podcast in terms of social media, obviously. Uh, but whether we like it or not, that type of content really works. And I don't know why it works. I don't know if it's because we're all just fucked up Adderall kid iPad babies at this point, and that's just how we consume content. But we can get really mad at the fact that you need to clickbait your titles and you need to use that little red circle that for some reason in our like fish brains just tells us to click on a video. Uh, or we can ride the wave and try to get commu- like try to communicate the best information that we can to the most number of people that we can. And if that takes putting a video of someone cleaning a carpet or someone playing Subway Surfer underneath the video of us talking about why you probably should use a wide spectrum of rep ranges to get as jacked as possible, then so be it. I don't know if that answers the general question, but I'm happy to expand further on that. No, Max, uh, go ahead, Eric. It As the resident only person whose age starts with the number four, I'm going to speak to some of the other people who I know are from uh, my generation, which is, depending upon what you look at, I'm either a millennial or I'm the, the one before that, uh, Gen X. So um, I would like to think I'm, I'm, I'm not a millennial, but I probably am 83. Who knows? Wikipedia is confused, so I'm confused. That's the <laughs> way I learn. Only citation needed. I'll just say that I think if you find yourself um, struggling with the way that content needs to be delivered on social media, so you take shots at some of these folks, um, and ultimately some of the people who do this, they pretty much only have long-form content. Like if you look at most of my content, 90% of it is podcasts, written articles, actual scientific publications, or being invited onto other channels where what I do is long form content and then it's edited down to medium form content of like the 18 to 15 minute variety that works on YouTube. If that's all all you do, it's because that's all you can do and know how to do. And you struggle when you try to do a 90 second reel to deliver the information that you think needs to be in there. And I get it because that's me as well. I do some of that, but it takes a disproportionate amount of effort for the output. But it also is the type of content that is seen by more people. So when you're critiquing someone for not bringing the level of nuance, and like you, like Pat pointed out, you got to appreciate the irony. Read the full text, read the full text, and you're critiquing a reel that's based upon a full text. Come on, right? Like, like you, you're smart enough to know that that makes like zero logical consistency from a, from a framing perspective. Acknowledge that what you're actually saying is, I hate social media. And that's fine. Don't disagree. I'm not a huge fan of it either. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, tell me another way to communicate to the masses information. And I've said this before. Social media platforms are not educational platforms. And it is, they're, they're, they're built to, to grab your attention. They're not built to educate. And that's just the way it is. YouTube is probably the only exception where that can actually be, like you can find tutorials for things on YouTube. So if, if you're unwilling or unable, and let's be honest, it's probably the latter, to do the things that other people are doing, and you're critiquing those, the, when, when people do do them because they don't have enough nuance, what you're actually saying is, I don't think these platforms provide sufficient nuance. They, they constrain the nuance, and fair enough. But like Pac said in the last episode, don't hate the player, hate the game, because that is the only way we have of promoting more information. And I can tell you this, when I first started getting into this information, I was just a selfish athlete. And I specifically remember being on the forums and trying to get Alan Aragon to stop explaining context to me and just tell me how much multidextrin I needed after my upper body workout and how should that differ when I'm doing my lower body workout. And him going on and on about, we only have acute trials, it probably doesn't matter, you're not even burning that much glycogen. I'm like, cool, cool, cool. How much? So 40 grams? And he was like, and he eventually like, it's fine to take half 30 grams, you know, like I, I get it. like, but the interesting thing was that that conversation among many others with folks like straight flexed, if you know, you know, that was Lane Norton back on the day on the forums and folks like Dr. Joe Klimzeski or folks like, uh, like you actually Brad Schoenfeld came around the same time as me, but, um, you know, he really didn't pop off until like 2010, but anyway, those, those conversations where I was coming from it, from a, just, just the facts, ma'am, 
You know, I just want to know what to do to, to, to leverage myself and getting more complex information and then not being able to get the success I wanted or hitting plateaus is what led me to then want to do a deeper dive. So even if you think everyone who really, if you're really about this life, you know what? You read the full text. You listen to the whole podcast. You at least watch a 20 minute YouTube video and the rest of this is just trash. You're not serious. You don't actually care. Listen, you want to break your plateau? You got to think hard. I get it. You know, it's kind of that almost like this intellectual kind of, uh, you know, like, like gatekeeping of, of listen, you, you, if you just want to be a dumb meathead, then you're going to be stuck with dumb meathead gains. Fine. But look, guess what? Like no one is going to know who the people are to even follow if they're not engaging with social media. How do you know to, to actually go listen or watch or read long form content if those people are non-existent in the, the types of ways that people initially engage with a given community or topic? So yeah, if you don't like social media, none of us do, man. But dude, don't act like it's the person. Come on. Max, and I want to... Uh, oh, go Patrick Willis. Sorry. It's that implication, the, oh, it's for fame and for the lusciousness. It's like, bro, I'm telling you now, if you could, if God came down and said, look, I guarantee you'll have the job you have now forever. No more money, no nothing. The same... Communism. Yeah. yeah, well... <laughs> um, that's an actual thing in Greece. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I would, I would be like, cool. I'd still be on social media, posting whatever, my training. I wouldn't be on YouTube doing two, two videos a week. I'd do 45 minute videos, uh, going over certain internet uh, personalities and doing deep dives on things they've said and they've made wrong, even though they claim everything they've said that there is right. Like the, obviously there's people out there that like the fame and the whatever, but as I said in the previous episode, if anything, it adds more and more pressure because you're yes. like, okay, we've gone the ball rolling now. We can't see those metrics now go completely down in the next six months because, okay, why have we invested all this money and time? Max. Yeah, I mean, so just uh, there's like a, bit, a trillion different things to talk about here, obviously, but with respect to the saturation of the market, with respect to the number of people getting out there. Uh, one of the reasons that I was so apprehensive about starting for so long is because, especially earlier, I was like, I'm just afraid that I'm just going to be like parroting everything that Mike Isratel is saying. And people are just going to be like, you're just parroting what Mike Isratel is saying. So like, why would we listen to you? And then you start to realize that, like Eric says all the time, we are a niche community within a niche community. And going to the Arnold was uh, a really big eye opener for me in that, uh, Pack, Milo, and Omar, uh, uh, huge uh, like heads within the in like evidence based side of fitness, all together sitting at a booth, lines pretty long. Like a lot of people were there, really excited to see all three of you. And then I walk around the corner, and there was a line wrapped around the entire building just to see to stand next to Eubanks. So just someone who, and uh, not a call out really, but someone who knows as much as the next guy about lifting. You know what I mean? Like it's just, the, uh, there's to a certain extent, just the personality of the person that you want to be with is, or the person that you enjoy is what's driving the, the majority of the clicks for these people, right? Uh, and I think that fortunately, Milo, Omar, Eric, Pac, you guys are all people that people genuinely enjoy. Y'all's personalities are enough to drive content, but that's not why people are coming to your videos. You know, people are watching you guys because... Maybe they're not getting meathead results at the gym because the meatheads that are just staying meatheads don't need to go read abstracts or studies or anything like that. Like the reason that I'm in this game, I try to think as laterally as I can here is because my genetics for muscle growth just aren't that favorable. I just don't have the best genes. So I had to go read papers to see why my friends were getting more jacked than I was. Right. And like as much as that sucks, it's it's a great thing that that exists. And I, I've talked to Dr. Schoenfeld about this a lot. The reason that he got into really studying the why behind the what's that people and trainers were saying was because he wasn't super satisfied with the results that he was getting in the gym, right? And I've gone off of a bunch of tangents here. I'm not even sure what I'm saying, but this is all to say that, yeah, we all hate social media. I fucking hate it. I wish that I could spend the rest of my life just thinking about how to train to get jacked and how to conduct studies to make sure that we're answering the questions that we all deeply care about. Like, are leg extensions the worst quad exercise? But that's not what's like driving clicks. That's not what's going to be like make me enough money to where I feel comfortable and safe in life. So 
I'm going to have to play the social media game. And yeah, I hate it. And to quote Andre 3000, I'm sitting here thinking, was I working just way too hard? Max, I want to keep with you because it's your first time. We treat you by far the best. Your first time you're allotted out of the two hours, 10 total minutes of talking time. You've only used six. So let's get the remaining four and then we'll go over to Milo. Uh, but I want to hear you. So you said something about Gen, uh, Gen Z, and this is the part that is absolutely true. Content every several years changes, if not every several months, uh, you know, as new platforms emerge. So why do you think YouTube introduced YouTube shorts? Why do you think Instagram now has Instagram reels? Basically with, uh, you know, the advent of TikTok, the popularity uh, therein, and people also, to your point, consuming content, I would say, you know, we could look this up, what's the average screen time for different age cohorts, but people are on their phones very often you're competing now more than ever because there are advertising dollars. Okay, we talk about social media underneath a capitalistic structure where we have to make some money. So you want to entice people to click your video. And if your video is not doing as well as another video, well, then the algorithm, of course, is not going to push it out because it wants to keep you on the platform. So with that in mind, Max, you said uh, kind of the most Gen Z perhaps attitude towards this. You notice that in other kind of accounts or places, that sometimes there will be, you know, the video content doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the voiceover or with the content. What are some things maybe as an outside observer now just newly participating? And then I want to go over to Milo talking about maybe some of the things that work for him and then same idea for Patrick Coles. I really want to open it up to you guys now in the last 30 minutes. Um, taking a look at it, what are some maybe either opportunities or areas that are worth exploring maybe to your point uh, as a content creator? Because let me just tell you, what you just said about yourself, man, about feeling like you're just going to pair what Mike Isertel says when you part, everyone feels that idea that what I'm doing is just, it's hyper generic. And guess what? It might be when you start out because you haven't found your voice. And let's quote another then genre, as Miles Davis says, it takes a long time to sound like yourself, where it's only through actively participating in the space that you start shaping the content. And you think, oh, this feels both more like me and I'm getting rewarded for this style of content. I want to do these things. So you will not develop a more unique identity unless you participate. But I want to hear from you, man. You said kind of Gen Z, the approach you're taking is a little bit different. What are some of your observations? What are some of your thoughts? Like what, where do you think you'll go with the content that you're making? Uh, to be honest, I think I'm just going to stick with shit that I love because I've seen so many people come into this kind of for the purposes of getting famous, not necessarily for the purposes of disseminating information. And ultimately, yeah, the goal is to teach as many people as possible the best quality content and the information that I know with respect to getting jacked, right? But I also know that if it's just going to be me sitting there talking to a camera, doing a bunch of edits of car crashes and people running down hills and stuff, my heart's not in that. I don't enjoy that. It's not fun. I don't want to be another talking head in fitness, even though I think that the information that I bring is valuable. I have to actually enjoy what I'm doing if I want to be putting out good content consistently over the long term, right? So I'm probably going to stick with this whole cooking thing because I really, really enjoy it unless it just continues to tank or not continues to tank, but ultimately tanks. And when Instagram fails and AI takes over and we're all fucked anyway. So who knows what's going to happen in the next five years. Uh, but I think if you just stick with stuff that not only you actually believe in, but you care about, even if the road doesn't lead to wh wherever it is that you want to go, you can at least look back and say, I stuck to my laurels and I actually believe in what I was putting out there, you know? And I think that's like a valuable thing. Uh, now, the last thing I'll say before we, we put it back over to, to Milo is that even though I was afraid of being just another generic voice or another talking head in fitness, and I still am afraid of that, obviously, uh, I think that even if there's a million Mike Isratels out there or a million Max Coleman's or whatever it is just saying the same thing, that's still drowning out the noises of the people that are saying shit that's just egregiously wrong, right? And if you have enough people saying you can do whatever you want in the gym and still get, it must like in like a genuine sense, like you, there's a lot of forgiveness with respect to hypertrophy. That's better than having uh, a handful of people saying, no, you have to do X, Y, and Z that has no research behind it whatsoever. And their citation is just them sticking up their arm and saying, look, I'm jacked It work for me. It'll work for you. Same. Okay. Sorry, he, right, Omar. Yeah. Go. So uh, like when coming up, I remember you looking up to, and I still do, but looking up to you, Eric, and like the RP stuff where I'm like, how many more podcasts will they invite him on to talk about the, and it's like the same with the minimum dose stuff. And we just, I just signed the, the book contract, sign the contract, big boy, um, for the minimum dose book, which will be 
through, you know, three pages, page. do some stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like, bro, I will spend the rest of my life telling people, hey, you can make great gains doing a few sets per week. You can get a lot of the health benefits going to the gym, 30 minutes. Like, it's fine to, to repeat ourselves. Like, if if we don't, the, the, the conversation and the, the content and our lives and our biggest hobby and our biggest love of lifting weights and our pursuit of learning more and more about muscle and strength and all those stuff, like it's, it would just stay in academia and that would be the end of it. Max just bought himself a second appearance by warming the cookies in our soul with that idea that you have to do something that you enjoy, you have to do with passion. And that's more important than the end outcome, speaking our language. Now, Milo, I want three weird tricks for a new person entering this space in order to grow in a genuine way. No, but let's 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 frame it this way. You've achieved uh, some success, and I w- I would definitely count it in terms of what less than a year. The first I've said this before. Your first for me, I'll speak personally. That before and again, there's power within uh, networks. There's power in leveraging that. If you have something that's super unique, or you look away, that's particularly like the Sam Sulik phenomenon is so funny to me, where people are trying to identify one variable where it's so many at once occurring and like randomness and like many many things that are not repeatable whatsoever. But I've said this often that to get your first thousand subscribers takes a lot of work. Um, your first 10,000, still a, a good amount of work. But my time course basically was, what, three years to get my first 1,000 subscribers, right? Making making somewhat uh, frequent content. And then even when I was making frequent content, about uh, three years to get 1,000. Then on the fourth year, I got 10,000. And then on the, it would be, yeah, within the fifth year, I got 100,000. As it, But I got way better at it because I started uploading more uh, content. I got really attuned to what was working and all those observations. Anyways, all that to say that people could just look at the number. Hey, Milo, you got 20, like 20,000, bro. Alex, you bet to your point, like it's like he gets 20,000 likes. But like, I think for how long you've been in the space, you are experiencing a lot of success. What are some key observations that you've noticed within yourself or even like, let's say pitfalls, man, like you've done some things like Patrick has just mentioned about the thumbnail, the title for one particular video. It's like, ah, like, man, that was a good video, but now it's not going to get the exposure it deserves. What, what are some uh, general observations here? And then I want to kick it over to Pac. For sure. So first of all, I think the game is not what it once was. Uh, when you were coming up, all you needed to do was screenshot you squatting through a purple filter or a green filter on there. Boom, baby. That's a thumbnail. He knows. Squat tutorial number 16. Um, but <laughs> regardless, I do think there's a lot of very low-hanging fruit when it comes to specifically YouTube, but just video production in general that people just don't really consider. It very much follows the 2080 general heuristic where you don't need to spend a ton of time on different components and facets of video production and content production to get a lot out of it. And both surprisingly and unsurprisingly, most people in the evidence-based fitness space kind of fail to even consider these things. And I think that is what is kind of holding them back. Like, look, many new PhDs in sports science or people who've done a lot of research in lifting, they have plenty of knowledge. And if they were to put out any content and they were to impact any number of people, they would be making a positive impact on the industry, right? So the question is really, they have the knowledge, how do we get it out to more people? And there's a certain few things that unsurprisingly, oftentimes are not considered because there's not much time available to do so. But I think people often overestimate just how little time or underestimate, overestimate, overestimate, just how little time it takes to learn some of these things. So titles and thumbnails, really easy things are to just learn about different kinds of hooks, you know? Like there's a hook that you can use with a question mark, right? Like you pose a question. Questions are interesting, especially if the topic is interesting. So if you ask a question in a title, that is already a hook. It is better than just having a random sentence as your title, right? That, that is a good thing. Another thing is in your thumbnail, try and have your face. Try and have it relatively prominent so that people know it is your video without needing to read the channel name. Then there's things like keeping the title relatively succinct. There's things like look up different types of hooks because not every hook will be amenable to every topic. So there's questions, there's making relatively bold statements that can kind of be controversial sometimes. There's citing numbers, for example. So if, you know, you have a meta-analysis saying that on average, length and partials cause 5-10% to more growth or what have you, you could have that as a title saying, length and partials cause 5-10% to more growth in 4-inch motion, question mark, or even as a statement. 
And because it's a number, people will be like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Like, let me see where this number is from. And there's different kinds of hooks. And all it takes is one Google search. And all of a sudden, your content has become quite a bit more enticing to anyone consuming it. It really is not complicated. Like, and that is kind of the first thing a viewer sees. And it does not take much effort, as far as the title goes at least, to get it right. As far as thumbnails go, it is mostly just keep it relatively simple. Have the main elements of the video in there. If you have a hook in the title, ideally make the thumbnail complementary, right? If you're touching on, I don't know, if you're touching on a relatively complex topic that's hard to describe in words, maybe keep the title simple, but then illustrate tempo, for example, in the thumbnail. Use some imagery to illustrate that. It's not difficult, but it does take some work, right? So thumbnails, I get why people aren't putting a lot of work into. Um, but then with the video side of things, there's a few things. One is to create a repeatable system and to initially be okay with just saying, look, I'm not going to make the best content ever. It's not going to be A1 from the get-go. I'm not going to uh, surpass Strong by Science on my first video. You know, like, they've been doing it for 10 years. 3MJ has been doing it for 10, 15 years. Like, you're not going to make your best content right out of the gate. And being okay with that is a big part of starting out with a content journey. Um, but I think a few big things are, one, pick the right topics. One, initially, just pick topics you're comfortable speaking on because otherwise you're going to struggle even more to make the content. So if you're in the science side of things, you might have a few topics that you've researched, actually done research in, or that you're particularly familiar with or passionate about or anything really. And then topics specifically that have, I would say mostly focusing on topics that have some mass appeal is good, right? If all the videos you do are on extremely niche topics like phototherapy for increasing recovery between sets or nitrate supplementation, for muscle endurance. That is cool, and I love it. But just realize that that's not everyone. So having some sense of what people actually care about is also good. Do I, do I think you need to always stick to the most popular topics and always just play that game? No. I think that having some proportion of your videos focus on the big hitters to build an audience is great. And then the remaining proportion, you can focus on what you think needs to be communicated even more. Maybe you have certain topics you think aren't being communicated enough, like maybe phototherapy research for resting between sets. Maybe lasers are the new big thing in lifting research. But I think figuring out that split and realizing which topics seem to be more interesting to people is important. And thinking, okay, what does my audience actually like? Because it's, it can be tempting to fall into a routine of just producing content on the things that you're comfortable talking about repeatedly, 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 but if the audience isn't interested, you're going to have a tough time. And then the final few things are more material, um, which is just figuring out the basics of things like videography, uh, some cinematography, some lighting stuff, and some audio stuff. It doesn't need to get fancy, but it also isn't expensive. Genuinely, nowadays, you can get a free trial to Skillshare for two months. You spend about 10 hours total on there. And you have literally gotten better at all of these components of video making than about 80 to 90 percent of video makers out there in fitness in about 10 hours. And you have not spent any money. The barrier to entry is essentially no. And so it pains me sometimes. And I understand why, because obviously hypertrophy researchers have their stuff going on. I totally understand that. But like the barrier to entry really is not massive in this regard. And just with a good title, a good thumbnail, a decent, repeatable setup, because ultimately if you want to grow an audience and get the message out there about the research, what you care about, what you think people need to hear about, you're going to need a system that is repeatable. And if you're someone who also has a job in academia doing research, that system needs to be as time efficient as possible. So set up somewhere, a tripod, a camera, talk to the camera, have an idea of how you're gonna schedule things, get organized. It's not like any, like producing content is a hustle. It's not something that just like, oh, I woke up, made some content, ta-da, I have five videos a week and things are going great, right? Like you have to plan this stuff just like you would for any other meticulous task that you're concerned about growing long-term. Um, so I would say learn the basics of videography, lighting, audio stuff, and you'll be above like 90% of videos out there already. And like, 
if I was able to do it, and I'm not like the busiest person ever, but I am relatively busy, if I was able to do it across six months, working about four other jobs at the same time, finishing my PhD, like, and obviously jobs, quotation marks, sports science jobs are, uh, you know, flexible, let's put it that way. But like, you can probably do it too. And I think that it would go a long way and kind of work your way down with titles and thumbnails at the top and then gradually improve your video production as you have the time and the finances to support it. But realize that it's not going to happen overnight unless you're Sam Sulek. And the Sam Sulek example is very amusing to me because nowadays I get in my YouTube recommendations so many videos that are titled exactly like his are. They are people are dressing exactly like he is. The same style, everything. 17 views. And it's like... People are really looking at Sam Su like, like there's some characteristics that make him who he is that are repeatable and, you know, you can just follow these guidelines consistently. And it's like, no, sometimes stuff just happens. There are still generalizable principles that seem to apply to literally 95% of successful content. But people are always looking at that 5% and like, ah, that guy's a weird physique. Is it the fact that he's doing a close grip bench press with his wrists together? Maybe? Like, you're always looking for that one thing. When in reality, it's just... Let's nail these generalizable principles and move on from there. So those are some general takeaways. Just be consistent, set up a system, get a hook in your title for God's sake, because otherwise like, it's hard to care. Like, how are you going to stand out from any other content creator if you don't even have a hook? If you, I have no reason to care about what you're saying. Like, if I just swipe and I see, oh, okay, there's something here. If you don't give me a reason to care, I'm going to keep swiping. And that's the case with YouTube, because you get tens of videos at the same time flashed on you. If I can't understand your title pretty quickly, if I can't see your thumbnail and be like, oh, this is an interesting topic and the, the hook is enticing, we have a problem, right? And I think none of us here would argue that our content doesn't need to reach a sufficiently large audience if it is to have the maximally positive impact it can have, right? So we need to care about how we package it, how we portray it. Otherwise, we are literally doing an ethical disservice to the community and ourselves. Eric, quickly, and then we'll go to PAC. That was, we're almost going to change now the title, Milo, Unrelated, to put so much actionable advice to one weird trick to explode your social media presence for this episode. Eric. Actually, let's go to me last because I, I want to use my uh, elder statesman privilege to close us out with a nice. couple of final words. Nice, yeah. So we have a uh, uh, PAC. I want to ask you, man, so we have uh, 10 minutes here. I want to say that one of the things I respect about you and uh, talking about playing the game but not being beholden to said game is that as an example, you do the content that you want to make that sometimes you can have a differential advantage. What I mean when I say that is like, okay, so you establish a relationship with someone like uh, Kiriakos, right, with Grizzly. Cool. If you wanted to turn your channel not into the Grizzly channel, but let's say to use, not exploit that relationship for views, you can make like five or six videos total, each one probably 100,000 uh, views. You could use that to leapfrog back over to your channel, content that's kind of semi-related, and then over time massage them into the stuff that you want to make. But you're like, nah, not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to make the content I want to make. I want to talk about maybe what Max also hinted at, the idea of having a vision and being satisfied with what you do personally. So like, you need to be viable. And I think Milo did a fantastic job of explaining like some fundamental principles that anyone endeavoring to do this needs to understand. But maybe let's talk a little bit about that artistry or the personal view that you have towards it. What are some things that you hope to achieve with the channel uh, besides, you know, millions and millions, if not billions of dollars that you want to do now that you are also five or six months into uh, producing content and learning from it? What are some things that you hope to accomplish? Where do you see the space? Like, give me your general thoughts. The main thing is to have a self-sustainable YouTube channel that it's paying for, you know, the editing costs and all and all that and grow it over time so that the name can be out there and I can proudly look back at the videos and be like, cool, I'm helping lifters and I'm helping people that don't want to overthink. But at the same time, I need to be, and I am being honest with myself and acknowledging that the type of content that I opt to put out is not always the most commercially smart content for example past two videos one is on like five things you're overthinking for muscle growth that's okay you know that that could be a bit more on the commercial side the other one is on why standardization shouldn't be a worry like those things are not hot topics and i must also acknowledge that hey i personally i will be happy if the channel eventually reaches the you know 100k subs mark and has its own niche following and at the same time 
if I ever become a millionaire, I want to pour that money into research. And ideally, I would do research for a living. But taking it back to the channel, the goal is self-sustainable channel, getting my name out there, putting out stuff that I like and is not full on niche. It's still playing the game somehow. But, you know, there's types of content that it's are not my thing. And cool, I'll take the... I'll take a step back and, and maybe do those couple of videos that are somewhere in the middle between what I like and what the game is. But um, yeah, I think it's important to recognize that because there's many times where I'm like, oh, I'll do a video on this. And then I'm like, hmm, I like this. And I'm pretty sure the five of us could geek out and speak about whatever topic for hours. Then I'm like, okay, I'm going to spend now three hours planning this for a thousand people to see it because they don't want. Um, and the same goes with Grizzly. Like there's been opportunities and there's people coming to visit him in Greece. I'm not going to do videos with them and put that on my channel because it's not what I enjoy and it doesn't fit with the ethos or the goal of the channel. But yeah, that's essentially the goal. Get the name out there, solid information, easy to watch videos, stuff that I can produce in a way that allows me to have some fun and, you know, grow it over time. Now, if I see that at some point the channel has plateaued and what I'm doing is not working, I'll try to change my ways or accept that, okay, it is what it is. Maybe take it down to one video a week because it's going to be too much money to just have a, a channel with 10K subs, you know, costing thousands per month. And that's about it. Still do good research, still participate in the field in other ways, geek out over a Stronger by Science, and life's good. Fantastic. Uh, Eric, real quick. Max, you got a minute, bro. Okay, it's your first appearance here. All three of you are about experience, Eric, as they know. The Iron Culture buff. Expect two new subscribers to each of your channels. Let's go. Max, one minute. Then, Eric, closing it out. Yeah, I mean, so as the last thing I'll say, just as the person with probably the biggest following and, and the uh, the best physique here, I, I really appreciate you guys letting me come on. It's going to be a really good tack right off this charity I've done for you all. So I, I really do genuinely appreciate it. All the paintings in the back you bought just in order to do this episode. So those are also write-offs? Yeah, yeah, of course. Actually, those are all, these are all fake. This is all AI generated. I'm actually outside in Central Park right now. And let me put some respect on your name. Max, give five of your favorite films because I dogged you a little bit at the start and then we're going to air because we still have the time. Uh, probably Inglorious Bastards, The Wolf of Wall Street, Interstellar, Inception, and... Ugh, yeah, I couldn't come up with another dumb, douchey bro movie. Pulp I Fiction. have no idea what my top... Yeah, Pulp Fiction, that would have been great. No, I don't know. Like, Lahane, that's a great movie. That's French. You like that, right? That's uh, pretentious enough for you to say I like movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah you yeah, mentioned yeah. you mentioned Max uh, in person. You said, do the right thing. And then he, uh, I, I remember your... I, I'm not going to kill the time. Interesting. Appreciate it. I'll go to Eric. I, first off, respect on the restraint, Omar. Okay. That right there, um, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. level of personal growth that that I I'm about to regress uh, next that episode. That must be acknowledged. I will yep. take the time. You could have said what you wanted to say, just to say, good job not saying what you wanted to say. I'm impressed. All right, using my old man privilege, I'm going to close this out. And I think there are two big things I want to say. One, we've had a relatively YouTube centric discussion here, which is fine. But there's a lot of things that apply. Both Max and Pax specifically talked about. Ultimately, you need to do something that you want to do and that connects with your values and that you can look back on and be proud of, regardless of the fact that there are all these things you need to do if you want to be successful on YouTube. And you may find that, well, shit, I don't want to be on YouTube then. And I would encourage you to try to figure out what is the platform that does fit you best and what does success look like there. And there are different versions of that. You know, there are, I mean, this is actually going to take more time than anything they talked about. But if you don't want to have your face out there, you can do like an animated thing with all graphics and videos and never show yourself on YouTube. Picture fit is an example, but I guarantee you that's going to take far more time. You got to learn to be an animator <laughs> than just talking to a camera. But on Instagram, you can play the real game, but we've actually been analyzing our own content on the Team 3D MJ channel and the reels aren't actually doing as well as some of our text-based carousels that give useful but practical information. Um, and there are infographic-based channels out there that do quite well. Um, or maybe you just don't want the long-form, heavy editing focus of YouTube, so like, you know, a TikTok or, or a reel-based approach. There is whatever's out there. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because far more people get off the content, I'll call it hamster wheel, and burn out because they're trying to do something that doesn't fit them rather than any of the other problems we've discussed. 
yeah, beefs and drama and all that can be annoying, but you, you, you get better at dealing with that over time and you learn to stop taking it so personal. And you also just learn to ignore it. Like I just don't read comments anymore because that's not really where, where there's any useful outcome from that. Maybe I get a feel for the room and the general take. Um, but you know, if, if I want to actually engage with people, then I'm going to do a live and answer questions and do a Q and a, like, there's a lot of ways to do this. And ultimately just like adherence is at the bottom of the pyramid, it doesn't matter volume, intensity, frequency, progression models, any of that, if you won't consistently do it. And if something is suboptimal, but you will consistently do it, but it's enough to grow, choose it because trying to do all these, well, first off, do actually try. Don't act like, you know, I just know that won't fit me. Like, like try, you know, and um, I, I think you need to find something consistent. And then now speaking specifically to the people who want to promote evidence-based and science-based information, I do think there is one rubric to consider as far as how far should you take clickbait content, thumbnails, and the way you package your information we talked about how people do actually find science exciting. I mentioned Carl Sagan. I'll mention Neil deGrasse Tyson. Science can be magical. And one of the things that Sagan and, and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson and all other like truly societally famous science communicators do, it's not just telling you neat tricks. It's not just kind of the, the, oh shit, did you know about this? They actually get you to think a little bit differently. They ask you to think a little bit more deeply, to expand beyond your horizons. When your quote unquote mind gets blown, that is part of the, the magic of science. And some of the quotes that are, you know, very cliche and, and very kind of vapid, but are actually kind of deep. Like, you know, it's uh, college education that's supposedly attributed to Einstein. Isn't about learning things, it's learning how to think. Like, oh shit, you know, like that, that is kind of cliche, but honestly, it's, it's true. And the one thing that I would encourage all science-based communicators and content producers to do is ask yourself, is the style and the delivery of your content, maybe you need to do all the things you need to do to get views, but are you actually aligned with scientific thinking? Are you at least not discouraging critical thinking? Because sometimes when we present things in black and white terms or best or worse, or very, very simplistic terms as framing, it does encourage the type of thinking that actually got us all here. And that is part of the magic of science. And I think that's actually one of the harder things to navigate. You know, how can I promote empiricism and rational skepticism while also having an entire messaging and style that is somewhat counter to those principles? That is hard. And I think that's where we slip up the most, but I'm also not very critical of that because if that was easy to do, then evidence-based fitness content would already be the most popular. So I would just encourage people just, just to think about that. Have it on your radar. I don't have an answer. Um, or obviously, I would have more subscribers and followers. But <laughs> I can at least identify the problem and then leave the younger, uh, the younger generation to solve the psychic vampire problem. So that's all I got to say, Omar. And I do want to sincerely thank uh, Milo, Max, and Patroclos. Try it on. See what you think. Dr. Pack, um, for their time, not only being on Iron Culture today, but their attempts in this space to make it better, which I do think are largely succeeding. And I encourage you all to continue despite some of the challenges and some of the flack and heat you're getting, because I think that is part of the process. And if you can learn to accept that, we'll all be better for it. Eric, that's our boy Helms. I will say that everyone should check them out. Congrats on the two subscriber bump. You guys earned it. I will thank every single person for making it all the way to the end of this episode. Batch of close. Give a number right now, bro. 41560. 41560. If you made it, leave it in the comment. I actually was super surprised. There's over a dozen people, like I said. 41560. You can also go ahead and leave a rating and review on iTunes. It does help us out. I just say that. We just like reading the reviews. Typically, people will give five stars. As we discovered recently amongst the hosts, sometimes five stars isn't enough because sometimes the content, if it's not 100% positive, well, then it's 100% negative. So go ahead and leave a rating review on iTunes. We're back every single insert date here. From now until the end of time, we'll catch you in that next episode.